Saturday, April 8th, 1944. New York City. It's a rainy day before Easter and World War II news is dominating consciousness. There are cracks in Germany's foundation. On Tuesday, April 4th, Allied surveillance aircrafts photograph the Auschwitz concentration camp. Knowing this, the Nazis will spend the next four months using the gas chambers and incinerators to their full capacity. 20,000 people could be murdered each day. The Germans have lost five U-boats in three days on both fronts, while simultaneously facing heavy fighting against the Soviets in Ukraine. They've been repeatedly forced to retreat. On Good Friday, April 7th, Adolf Hitler suspended all law in Berlin and made Joseph Goebbels the sole administrator of the city. On this day, April 8th, the Battle of the Tennis Court began in Burma, while Soviet forces invaded Romania. At the same time, U.S. bombers shelled Brunswick. The early 1944 bombings of German cities gave German citizens their first hard evidence that the tide of the war had turned. And everyone in Europe knew a full-scale Allied Western invasion was coming. Amidst the gloom, at 1.45 p.m. from WEAF in New York, John McVeigh took to the air with NBC's War Telescope, looking at both war news and peacetime negotiation. From London, the National Broadcasting Company presents War Telescope, a review of the war week and a forecast of possible developments to come. War Telescope features John McVeigh of NBC's London staff, a veteran reporter of the European scene. For his regular Saturday report, we take you now to London. This is John McVean in London. Less than an hour ago, it was announced here that a strong force of American fortresses and liberators today bombed the aircraft factories in Brunswick, Germany, and aerodromes in the northwestern part of the country. It's estimated that between 500 and 750 heavy bombers and 500 escorting fighters took part in the raid. Brunswick has already been heavily bombed, and it's probable that today's attack was chiefly to stop rebuilding in what was once one of Germany's chief centers for producing Luftwaffe fighters. Lord Beaverbrook and Mr. Burley held a news conference for press and radio representatives today. They discussed the preliminary civil aviation talks they've been holding. It was announced that both sides had to make concessions, and United States and Russian officials are going to meet, probably in Washington. Both British and Americans seem determined that no German or Japanese air carriers will be allowed to operate after the war. It was said there must be standardization of international air operations, and equality of competition must be maintained in international air traffic. I've talked about civil aviation with experts here. They believe that differences between America and Britain can be solved very rapidly. One chief problem remains for the International Air Conference of the Allies. Many nations will have a valid claim to run their own international airlines. Belgium, Holland, and France, for instance, must link up with their distant empires. Russia covers the immense stretch of the Baltic to the Pacific with her own territory, and it would seem likely that she'll take as large a part in international aviation as any of the other nations. British experts feel it would be suicidal for nations to throw all routes open to unrestricted competition, for the volume of post-war air traffic, even in the most optimistic estimates, couldn't support, say, a dozen different transatlantic lines. Saturday's New York Daily News reported on the U.S. Navy's recent sinking of 46 Japanese ships, while they also shot down more than 200 planes in a three-day period. Inflation hadn't risen in an entire year, as Americans look forward to international air travel after the war. It made for an interesting Easter Sunday forecast claiming that because we've built air bases in various parts of the world, we therefore have the right to keep them after the war and use them as civilian air transport terminals. It's only fair to say that the impression abroad is that we built the bases to help win the war, not as a means of extending post-war air transport. But the coming international conference will probably clarify thinking on the whole subject. You've heard the Allied air attacks on Germany and the occupied countries described as the prelude to invasion the necessary preliminary weakening of an opponent's strength, so he'll be less able to stand up under a combined land, sea, and air attack on Western Europe. There's another kind of preliminary work that had to be done before the weight of the continent could be cleared, cripple his sea power. German sea power meant two things, submarines and the two great battleships, Scharnhorst and Tippetts. 
against submarines, the combined navies and air forces of Britain and America have been waging bitter and successful war. The strength of the German U-boat Pax has been broken, if not shattered completely. The resistance they can offer to invasion convoys is not important. There remain the two battleships. Hidden up in the fjords of northern Norway, they could strike northward against our convoys to Russia or southward against the second front armada of troop transports and landing craft. In theory, a single German battleship could blow to bits a convoy protected only by cruisers and destroyers. Only battleships, her own class, could stand up and slug it out with her. You know how this preliminary work, removing the menace of the German battleships, was accomplished. How the British home fleet caught and sank the Scharnhorst a few weeks ago. How last fall, British midget submarines crippled the tippets with torpedoes and put her out of action for months. But those winter months of darkness, gales and snow blizzards made further attacks impossible. And covered repair ships slipping up through the Norwegian islands. The Tippets had to be kept out of action. Action especially at the crucial moment of invasion. You've heard that British naval aircraft, many of them made in American factories, took on the great job of keeping the Tippets out of the war. Today, I've brought Commander Anthony Kimmins of the British Navy, who was on one of the aircraft carriers, to give a first-hand impression of the action. Commander, why was the decision taken to use naval planes flying from aircraft carriers rather than, say, midget submarines again, or land-based bombers? Well, midget submarines couldn't be expected to succeed a second time. You see, they depend on sheer impertinence, audacity, and complete surprise. The enormous distance from the North Cape, the northernmost point in Europe, ruled out the use of shore-based heavy bombers. No, the only answer was naval dive bombers and fighter escorts operating from aircraft carriers. So what kind of weather did you meet? On the day of the attack itself, the weather was unbelievably good. But during the first part of the passage up north and way up into the Arctic Circle, the weather got colder and bitterer every day. And when the wind flow over the flight deck is a 40 mile an hour snow blizzard and the spray breaking over the forecastle is freezing before it touches down, those flight deck parties on an aircraft carrier have one of the toughest jobs imaginable. The pilots sighed with relief when, just before dawn on the day they were to attack, they found perfect conditions calm sea, and a clear sky with patches of cloud. On the flight deck, engines roared. The carriers and the escorting ships were all heeling over, swinging into the wind. As the steam jet up in the bows, to show when the ship is dead into the wind, would open up. Lumps of ice shot in the air. Welcome to Breaking Walls, episode 150. My name is James Scully. Tonight on Breaking Walls, we parachute into Easter Sunday, 1944 for a day of radio, recollections, and reconciliation. It's now less than two months before D-Day. U.S. citizens are awaiting word of a full-scale European invasion with held breath. If this is your first time listening to Breaking Walls, welcome to the show. You can find this series on every podcasting platform and at thewallbreakers.com. Tonight's opening song, is Modest Mazorski's The Old Castle, played on strings and part of Mazorski's pictures at an exhibition. Join the Breaking Walls Facebook group to keep in touch with news, snippets, photos, and other additions to the podcast at facebook.com slash groups slash the wall breakers. And the first eight chapters of Burning Gotham are out everywhere you can get a podcast and at burninggotham.com. It was a 2022 Tribeca Film Festival audio selection. You can also support these shows for as little as $1 per month at patreon.com slash thewallbreakers.
It's 11.30 a.m. on a rainy Easter Sunday, April 9th, 1944 in New York. We're taking a ride inside a 1942 Oldsmobile B44 Coupe. There have been no new automobiles manufactured in the U.S. since 1942. All resources have been put towards the war effort. Again next Sunday, when Admiral brings you World News Today by shortwave, direct from leading news centers of the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. We've just switched on the radio to CBS's New York affiliate. Invitation to Learning is about to air. An invitation to learning. An invitation to sit in on a discussion of significant books. Not much is known about the Roman poet and philosopher Lucretius beyond the fact that he left us one complete book. But that one is a masterpiece. It is the long philosophical poem on the nature of things. Our chairman for today's discussion of this work is Lyman Bryson. His guests are Moses Hadas, J. Professor of Greek at Columbia University and author of A History of Latin Literature, and Robert Elliott Fitch, Dean of the Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, California, and author of The Decline and Fall of Sex. Now to begin this discussion of On the Nature of Things by Lucretius, here is Lyman Bryson. Lucretius is strange even among the a real iconoclast in the world because we know so little about him because his attack upon the idols of his day was so profound as a matter of fact some of the time servers of this time the, just before the beginning of the roman empire uh, rather uh, like to say they hadn't read lucretius it was uh, something you didn't get uh, uh, caught reading in public first taking to the air on may 26 1940 it was chaired by lyman bryson with a rotating panel Based on a class at St. John's College in Annapolis, Invitation to Learning was developed at the suggestion of Stringfellow Barr, the school president, who also served on the CBS Adult Education Board. By exploring classic literature, Barr contended that radio could be a keynote in liberal education. Three or four people had a spontaneous discussion about a particular book. For 24 years and more than 1,200 episodes, the show sparked as much debate among listeners and rival networks as the programs themselves. Notable guests included Norman Corwin, John Hausman, Eva Le Gallienne, Herbert Hoover, Hans Conried, and Lillian Gish. teaching, I suppose we need to remember that it is practical atheism, but not technical atheism. That is, Lucretius believes in the existence of gods. He's willing to, uh, Mr. Fitch, to say they may exist. He doesn't say Oh, may. Be. He uses them, don't you think he uses them more as as um, sort of a stage dressing for his great thoughts. Well, his point is that if they do exist, they live a carefree Epicurean life, that they are not troubled by us, and we should not be troubled by them. So it's a matter of indifference whether they're there or not. But this cuts right to the root, doesn't it, of the ancient idea of the state, that the state is an expression of God's will. And at the root of religion, I mean, to say that there are gods who are off in heaven somewhere having a delightful picnic because if they had to keep book on human conduct and meet out the quite and so on, what's the use of being a god? Well, for all practical purposes, there are no gods. I mean, we're just quibbling with words if we say there are gods but they don't affect us because we define God by, by his effects. So that this, this man is actually, to all intents and purposes, atheist by our conviction, a convinced atheist, a man who is convinced that a great part of the unhappiness of the world, uh, people's fears, people's terrors, uh, is due to religion, and he is going to relieve them of it uh, with his poem of his. Isn't it rather curious that a man should have taken a long and even at its best difficult poem as a means of uh, giving people peace of mind, Mr. Haddis? Well, I uh, presume that no one would think of doing it today. Uh, the question always comes up, if anyone takes uh, Lucretius on the nature of things or the nature of the universe and reads through it hurriedly, you'll get the impression that he's looking at a textbook of physics. And, of course, nobody would dream of writing a textbook on physics, even though the physics is meant to prove that the world is material and therefore there's no need for gods uh, in verse. But this is a poem. Here's a man who has what seems to me to be the essence of poetry, a sense of wonder. I've often wondered why nobody's written a poem about the nebula hypothesis, which is, which is a subject for poetry. And it's very convincing because... It is. 
Opposite on NBC's WEAF was a commentary from Don Hollenbeck, while Mutual's WOR broadcast an Easter sunrise service from the Hollywood Bowl. And the Blue Network's WJZ broadcast the Hour of Faith 